So this is called, okay, A Spirit of Legend. This was written by Reese Sosby, okay? Um, and we, we got access to this on the February 25th, 2011, right? So it opens up with a very short paragraph uh, before jumping into the story. So, and if I remember right, this is such a good story as well. This is really good. Um, so, life in the frozen Shiver Peaks carries many harsh burdens, and those who choose to live there must be as stalwart as the mountains themselves. The Norn have many virtues, among them a fierce tenacity and a zest for the challenges that life brings. One of the most fundamental parts of Norn culture is their reverence for the spirits of the wild, manifest embodiments of the natural world. These spirits are not only sources of inspiration, they are guides and allies through the difficult journey of life. So as we saw, like they, they guided the Norn down from the uh, Far Shiver Peaks, which is like I said, I think that's the, the most direct interaction I've ever heard about between these. So. Here it jumps into the story, okay, so um, how many sections of this story is? It's about the same length as the last one we read, uh, but this one ends on like just a brilliant little snippet at the end. But yeah, I, I won't get ahead of myself. So here we go. Uh, this is the start of the story that's going along with this book post. The fire blew sparks toward the heavens like stars seeking to return to their high, dark home. But there was no joy in this blaze, no celebration. What had once been a proud lodge was now little more than piles of ash huddled in the shadows of flickering, emberlit logs. I am sorry, Viscar. The old scout placed his hand on the boy's shoulder. There's nothing we can do. Your father lost the house and everything in it on his last wager with Grimhild. She cheated, she cheated, but I can't prove it. What of my father, Fiuk? The youth snarled the words, biting off the syllables like a wolf gnawing its leg out of a trap. Did she have the right to kill him too? Old Fiuk sighed. He was wrong to attack her. There will be no retribution for the wolf born of Holbrack from Grimhild's actions. Nor should you seek vengeance upon her, Viscar. You are a new hunter, barely old enough to bear your own blade. Grimhild is powerful, and legends of her cruelty are told at the moot to frighten children and humans. Shaking his head, the skald pulled a leopard fur cloak closer about his wary bones. Put away your anger, young one. Bury your father. Leave this matter to the crows. No, Viscar wiped away the tears with the back of his hand, leaving soot stains across his pale cheeks. I may be young, Fiak, and I may be inexperienced, but I am still Norn. Alright, so there we go. So that's the setup of the story, uh, and then we go straight into the next bit of the blog post, which is titled Bear, Snow Leopard, Raven, and Wolf. So these are the four spirits. If you remember in Eye of the North, it was established there were a lot of spirits of the wild, and in fact, we heard about quite a lot of them, but never saw most, and this was the thing, right? In Guild Wars 2, it's established there are a lot as well, but we never saw or heard much about many of the spirits of the wild. In the Eye of the North manuscript, it actually mentions a few other spirits of the wild, like Doliak and stuff, um, that never actually appeared at all in-game in, in Eye of the North. It strikes me, it seems like with ArenaNet, they write those uh, manuscripts far before the actual final game is finalised, because if you remember in Nightfall, they had all that stuff about game mechanics with Razor and how he could be any profession and yet that never ended up in the game but they couldn't change it so I wonder how maybe earlier on in the development of Eye of the North when this manuscript was written that we're going to have a lot more spirits have a much more prominent role but in the end they didn't. Obviously we had three main ones we had Wolf, we had Raven and we had Bear in Eye of the North and um, arguably Bear was the one that got, had most thought go into it because Bear was the one that the Norn could actually transform into. In lore, Norn can transform into any of them. They, they, they can do whatever they want. Like, they can tra transform into Raven, they could go into Wolf, and and they can go into Bear and any of the other ones. But uh, I guess it was just uh, a matter of Eye of the North having, not having enough development time on it. So it turned out that they only allowed the Norn that we met could turn into the bear. Obviously we got the blessings of Raven, Wolf and Bear, but we couldn't actually transform into all of those. So uh, do bear that in mind. Obviously in Guild Wars 2, another one's kind of risen to prominence. You still have Raven, Bear and Wolf, but there's also Snow Leopard has kind of risen to one of the big four. And you can turn into any of those. You can actually become like a Were Bear, you can become a Were Raven and so forth. You as a, pl as a Norn player can transform, which is super cool. Um, but we never really saw enough of that in Eye of the North. But here we're going to learn about these. So bear, snow leopard, raven, and wolf. The Norn believe in personal strength, individual victory, and an earthy spirituality that is both primal and complex. They revere the spirits of nature, embodied in animals that are both guardians and essence of the world. It can be said that there are probably as many spirits of the wild as there are basic types of animals. One spirit of wolf to embody all wolves, one spirit of doliak to teach lessons of strength and perseverance, and so forth. Unlike the human gods, these spirits of the wild do not represent high-minded concepts like war or nature, but instead embody all the complex virtues and vices of the animals they represent. So I, I quite like this, that there are a lot of spirits and all of them 
I, I suppose, are regarded as all being very multifaceted themselves. And now we've got a screenshot in the blog post, by the way. Oh, this is... I remember the first time I saw this. People freaked out. It was so cool. It's a huge mountain with, basically, images of the big four um, spirits sort of carved into it. It's incredible. When I first saw it, though, I will be up there on the screen. Do you see the one at the back? Um, the one at the very back is Raven. I, when I first saw it, I didn't twig that these were the four main things, and I was trying to figure out what they were. I could see that the first one was Bear, but I wasn't sure about the other ones. And I thought the one at the back was like a whale. I thought that was like, you know, like the tail of a whale as it's like diving into the water. And then it wasn't, I, I like made a, such a stupid post on the forums and somebody replied straight away and they were like, what are you talking about? That's Raven. And I was just like, oh no. But yeah, it's awesome, isn't it? I really like it. And you can go there and see it. And indeed in the demo, you do go that way. In fact, that's near where you are in the tutorial. It's really cool. Because of their history, the four most important spirits of the wild to the residents of the Great Lodge of Holbrack are Bear, Snow Leopard, Raven and Wolf. Okay, so why exactly? What is this history? These spirits were the ones that manifested themselves to lead the Norn survivors south after their northern homelands were ravaged by the rise of the elder ice dragon Jormag. So that's the only kind of description we get of this. Why, we, we never find out why those specific four spirits did it. Which is really kind of interesting. I wonder whether it's one of those things we'll never learn about or they'll just sort of be, oh, it's because they're mysterious and you'll never truly understand the ways of the spirits of the wild. I wouldn't like that so much. I'd like them to actually explain it. But that is why these are the big four, essentially. Obviously, we can look at this in real world terms and say, well, hold on, Arena Net don't have the resources to make a million different forms for every single Norn character because that would just be way too many skills. It wouldn't be balanced. It would take too many resources and so on. But this is the story behind it, okay? So these four led the Norn south. Bear is the most revered of all of these spirits, and she, there you go, there you go again, she is seen as an icon of strength, insight, and wisdom. Snow Leopard is a solitary, stealthy spirit, much like her animal kin, and the Norn respect the secrets she collects. Raven is the cunning trickster who loves riddles and wordplay, and Wolf is the spirit of teamwork, friendship, and family. I don't know, I guess players are supposed to identify with one of these more than anything. It's funny, I do think I uh, I recognise most myself as being Wolf. I'm not necessarily too into the Norn, but I think if I roll a Norn, just spirit of teamwork, friendship and family, yeah, I reckon, I reckon I'd be a Wolf over the others. I just love the idea of like hunting in packs to take people out. I know, it's cool. So what about you guys? What do you what do you think you prefer? Raven, maybe? The cunning trickster? Or Snow Leopard, the, the lone fighter who's all stealthy? Or Bear, just basically a massive badass who's also insight and wisdom. So it's, it's funny though, because... Raven really was the one about wisdom, I suppose, in Guild Wars 1, but they seem to have given that to Bear instead, and now Raven's more of just a trickster. I don't know. Norn choose to follow the path of a certain spirit of the wild because they feel a kinship to the lessons it teaches. So there you go. Uh, we, you basically do get to pick one of these when you create your character, and you get like a, a measly paragraph to explain it at the start. That's the thing, character creation in Guild Wars 2 is really cool, right? But it kind of upsets me that you don't really get to learn so much about it. I suppose not every single player, the first instant they start playing the game, before they're even in the game, before they even created a character, want to learn paragraphs and paragraphs about all these different things. But it kind of sucks that you have to make the choice before you really know what choice you're making in full, and you, all they give you is like a paragraph. Which is why I've always favoured games like... And I shudder to say it, but I did play for a, for a very short while, years ago now. I played Maple Story, and like, there's a lot of games like that that start you off, and they don't give you a crap load to do a character creation. Instead, they let you slowly choose what class you want to be as you go through. Um, I think that's a way better system of doing things, and particularly with Guild Wars 2, where you're deciding, like, for instance, the Char get to decide who their best friend is, like, who, who their best friend in their warband is and stuff. And it's like, well, come on, why can't we meet them in-game and then make that decision as we go through? In fact... ArenaNet did talk about, when they first talked about their character creation, they talked about how um, uh, originally there were going to be loads of different choices players could make, loads of different choices at the start, but slowly as they refined the... Um the system that they were using, they decided that a lot of these choices could be made through the natural course of gameplay instead of just thrown at you at the start. Um, and I'd just like to see that be extended a little bit more so that essentially you, you, you pick whether you're male or female, you're going to have to pick what race you are at the start, but that's it. Even profession, I think, is a good idea to let people choose a profession once they're actually in game and start people out as some kind of like basic profession. I'm, I'm a big fan of that idea, but they just they don't really do it. So but anyway, so the non choose to follow the path of a certain spirit of the wild because they feel kinship to the lesson it teaches. What will you choose? It's important to note that simply because the four spirits work together to help the Norn survive Jormag's attacks, it does not mean that they or their followers are always on the best of terms. Followers of Wolf, for instance, scorn Snow Leopard's stealth as cowardice, and the shamans of Bear have been known to mistrust Raven's adherents, calling their deception dishonourable and weak. 
Tales of epic battles between heroes of each lodge are told at moots, immortalising in legend both the virtues and vices embroidered by their patron spirits. So what you get at Holbrack is there are four great lodges, essentially there's four huge lodges, and uh, depending on who you pick, you'll basically hang around that lodge a whole lot more. It's a system you see happen quite a lot in the other capital cities, like for instance, Rattasum springs to mind. They've got their three colleges, and you kind of pick one of those. It's kind of the same, it's, it's kind of the same system, it's pretty cool. I don't know how much that will actually affect your gameplay though. Um, I, see, it's so weird, I like the idea of a game where you get loads of choices and there's loads of splits, but it also it upsets me when games take it too far because then like for instance the main storyline tends to be a lot short, shorter and a lot less impactful because a lot of the resources have gone into developing all these different branches and that kind of sucks. I'm worried that Guild Wars 2 will suffer from that. I would always, if you gave me the choice and you said right we can either make one awesome long storyline, it's about a massive adventure, it's got all these different dynamics in it, you always meet the same characters but the characters are always well thought out and there's always good interactions going on. Or do you want a game where it's more about your choice and you go off and do lots of different things and there's loads of splits in the story constantly and you said which one do you want to me? I would always pick the solid big long storyline because I they, they, people say oh if you had loads of splits then it makes the game more replayable and yeah alright that's fine but if you make it a solid awesome experience that blows your mind as you go through it and leaves you feeling freaking amazing after the conclusion of the story you're going to want to replay it at some point anyway because you're just going to remember how much you love that game and you're going to want to go back to it so uh, it's kind of weird I, I, I would prefer a solid story and then choices in gameplay for instance like choosing what kind of character you want to play rather than choices that affect the story that I think is the best mix because then you get the replayability of being able to make different choices but you also get a, a meaningful impactful story but in any case it's, it's something a lot of MMOs suffer from because obviously as soon as you add multiple races you're gonna introduce that kind of thing anyway unless you sort of have all the races group up very early on in the storyline so I mean that's the that's the other thing I don't like about multiple races that I always enjoyed about Guild Wars 1 is that everyone can have sort of a, a determined starting location which makes the world feel a lot more dangerous and much more full of adventure because if you've got loads of starting areas scattered around the world like Guild Wars 2 has I could start at the the pale tree and think and, and then I don't look to the other side of the Tyria I don't look over there with sort of wide eyes and think oh, think of all the mysteries no one's really been around there think about how dangerous the enemies are think of all the awesome things that are hidden out there I don't get that that doesn't go one in my head because I know no that's just another starting location loads of new players are going on over there there's nothing particularly secret or interesting over there but and by secret I mean there could be secrets I suppose but I mean things that not many players have seen or gone to so it does take a bit of that mystery out I suppose it's not a big deal but it's just something that I sometimes think about anyway I keep going off topic so um so yeah after that little snippet of lore there we get to go back to the story so um back to the story it says the stars above the Shiver Peaks were cold and bright, crowned by the iridescent borealis of the northern sky. In the great lodge of Holbrack, a youth stood before the shamans and sought lessons of revenge. No, said the shaman of Bear. Learn strength, Viscar. Learn wisdom. Grimhild does not seek victory. She seeks the utter annihilation of her enemy. I will not teach you to throw away your life. I am sorry, said Wolf's followers. We would gladly help you avenge your family, but what you propose is suicide. Think of your pack. If you attack Grimhild, she will punish those who you love. The Haveron of Raven shook his head when Viscar asked. You cannot tell me how she cheated. Grimhild is clever, and she always has a lethal surprise for her enemies. If you do not know more than she does, she will destroy you. Viscar clenched his fists. Will no one help me? A shadow moved in the corner of the lodge, and yellow eyes gleamed. You haven't asked me yet, murmured the speaker of Snow Leopard, Valharantha. Her movement smooth and graceful. Will Snow Leopard teach me to take vengeance, he asked. If I follow her path, will she show me how to defeat Grimhill? More. Valorantha lowered her eyes and smiled. She will turn your vengeance into legend. Okay, so uh, the next section is a shaman's burden. Unlike humans, whose priests are revered for their dedication to one god, all Norn feel equally guided and befriended by the spirits. See, this is weird. It says this line that they're all equally guided and befriended by the spirits, and yet they all portion themselves off and scorn each other for, for sort of going to different lodges. That's a bit weird. Maybe that's just a whole rack thing, that, but the Norn on a whole do worship all spirits. Some Norn don't follow a particular path, preferring instead to revere all the spirits of the wild, following each whenever its lessons are relevant in their day-to-day -day lives. 
Those who choose to become shamans devote themselves to a spirit's sacred area, a shrine, a lodge, or a hunting ground dedicated to their patron spirit of the wild. They serve their people as guardians and as teachers, protecting their territory and instructing others in the lessons of the spirit they revere. Okay, so you get this this type of norm called shamans. You're gonna we're gonna learn as this blog post goes on about lots of different types of um, norm that, that are seated in various levels of spirituality, if you will, um, which is quite cool. And I'm actually happy I'm reading about this because I read it a long time ago, but I'm I'm quite hazy on exactly what's going on with these Havarons, which obviously we heard about just now in the story. Um, so then we get a screenshot here of just two norm with some armor that a lot of people geeked out over because you know armor. Everybody likes to dress up. Uh, that'll be up there on the screen as well. Um, four of the most powerful and dedicated shamans are known as the spellcart are known as the speakers of Holbrack. Okay, so you've got your four lodges, and essentially at the head of these, you've got a shaman for each. Um, they tend to the four lodges that flank Holbrack's main hall, which were raised in honor of the spirits that led the Norn to safety. So yeah, I should have mentioned this as well. You've got four great lodges in Holbrack. Obviously, there's lots of other minor buildings as well, but there's also the one in the center, which is the Great Hall. And I'm, I'm, I think... I can't remember, isn't it the Great Hall where your personal instance is? Because I don't think you get a different personal instance depending on what lodge you identify with most. That would have been cool, but I, I seem to remember being disappointed that that wasn't the case. So, um, it could be the case. I don't know, i have to look up at that. Sorry guys, I might edit in uh, uh, some text in a minute to, if I've actually managed to look up at that at some point later on this day. Um, the wise Alarin of the Frostborn speaks for Bear's Lodge. Mode of the Black is Raven's learned speaker, and the Wolf Lodge is kept by a young speaker named Fastolf Jotharson. The beautiful and mysterious Valorantha is the speaker of Snow Leopard. Okay, and Valorantha obviously is the one we just heard about um, just now in the story. So these characters that are going to be real characters will meet in-game, real NPCs. Um, you interact with them quite heavily, I believe, in the start of your Norn story. Um, and I suppose one more than the others, depending on who you chose at character creation. The shamans can be found across all of the Shiver Peaks, and they can even be found in far-flung areas. But there is one special type of shaman known as a Havaron, which is far less common. I think I say that right anyway. Havaron? Yeah. A Havaron is a special servant of the spirit, a vigilant and active defender of the spirit's interests in both this world and the next. This is where it gets really good. This is the most interesting stuff, um, I think, for the Norn anyway, because this, the Havarons are so similar to the Kodan guys, the, the, the Kodan that leave the, um, that lead various sanctuaries in combination with the voice and the claw. Uh, they're, they're so, so, so so similar, I'm just really curious about how actually they're related. A Havaran has the unique ability to physically cross into the mist and go to the Hall of Spirits, where the brave live forever. And this is just mentioned in passing as well. The Hall of the Spirits, that sound familiar to you guys? Yeah, it probably does. Uh, the Hall of Heroes, maybe? The Hall of Spirits, where the brave live forever? Seems like it's the, the same thing, it's just different races view it differently somehow. Um, they do not need to open a portal or perform a ritual unless they are taking others with them. Alone, Havaran Havarons can simply step into the spirit realm, sending their spirit into the mist as easily as crossing a hearthstone. See, this is nuts! There are none that can do this. This is so weird. I, I, it makes me think about uh, what other races can do. Is this what we're seeing the Massart doing at times when they just teleport around when they took away Saul D'Alessio and stuff? It's so, so weird. There is only one Havaron per spirit of the wild, and there may be another in training if the current Havaron has grown old or wary and, and is preparing for their final crossing into the mist. So there is a finite number of spirits of the wild. Don't forget, this is where they, the Norn do differ from the Kodan quite significantly. The Kodan think there are spirits for everything, even inanimate objects. There is a spirit of rock. There's spirits for everything, right? But the Norn have just a finite amount of spirits, and I think they're usually spirits t taken after the most prominent um, wildlife and beasts that come in to interact with the Norn's way of life, for instance. This is something else interesting. Do they believe in a spirit of Asura? Do they believe in a spirit of humans, a spirit of Char? See, I mean, uh, why wouldn't they? Is it just because they're intelligent races? Do they believe in a spirit of Norn? I guess we would have heard of it if they believe in a spirit for themselves. Do they believe in a spirit of Kodan? Indeed. I mean, it's quite interesting, isn't it? I think we need more definitive lines on how many spirits these Norn actually believe in. Uh, there is only one Havron per spirit. There may be another in training. So then we get another um, screenshot here of two more Norn with some more, more armor, which will be going up. Um, we get a new section here called the Other Spirits, right? Primarily, the Norn of Holbrack revere the four spirits of the wild that led them south, but other spirits exist and teach them lessons of their own. Some are less powerful, such as Minotaur, Worm, or Eagle, and they are rarely seen or called upon. See, uh, why are they less powerful? I mean, freaking Worm? Worm is less powerful? Really? And how does Eagle differ from Raven? 
It's quite weird. Maybe it's just because they're only rarely seen. Uh, some spirits are not sentient, such as mountain, fire, or darkness. Oh, so they do have spirits indeed, or of just more sentient objects. And I can imagine them having spirit for fire, definitely, and darkness. And these spirits are depicted as challenges to strive against or legendary obstacles placed in a hero's path, rather than friends or guides like the spirits of the wild. So I guess if 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 the, the entity interior has some manner of intelligence or sentience, then they're more friends that guide the Norn. While rather if they're something that the Norn can't un understand that's potentially just quite destructive, such as fire or arguably darkness as well, then they're more... Um, then they're depicted more as challenges, which would make sense as well. Um, there is also a small group of spirits that are revered with great sorrow. These lost spirits of the wild remained behind to fight Jormag. Owl, Doliak, also known as Ox, Eagle and Wolverine are lauded for their bravery and their sacrifice. So here, look, spirits of the wild that died. They're, they're dead. I don't know why the Norn view them as dead. It's just because these spirits aren't somehow appearing to the Norn anymore. See, this is the other thing. The Norn are... The, the spirits are real things. We've seen the spirit of bear in Eye of the North. Does that mean that there's a real spirit of fire that has approached the Norn at some point? Maybe? I mean, how does that work? It's quite weird, isn't it? Uh, Owl's death is known to the Norn. The last Haveron of Owl confirmed it. But as to the final outcome of Doliak, Evil, and Wolverine, even the Shamans do not know. This is interesting. I wonder if this is... Um, they established this mystery here because they're going to take it up with like a side quest or some events or something in Guild Wars 2 that maybe these spirits have actually uh, seceded from the Norn and now they believe uh, and now they're sort of working alongside with Dragon because don't forget there are the Elder Dragons and if I remember rightly the Norn do believe in spirits for these things so no Norn has been blessed to serve as Haveron to those spirits in generations but then it's not uncommon for weaker spirits or those who are not close to this world to be without a Haveron all that is truly known is that these spirits held the line in the far north and, by their bravery, aided the Norn in escaping Jormag's claws. See, oh, how much of this is Norn's story? How much of this is real events that happened? And how much of it is indeed relevant to what we're going to be doing in Guild Wars 2? Really interesting. That's the most mysterious stuff. That's the bit I like most about this blog post, I must say. Just because, I guess, you know, where there's a good mystery, there's a, a lot of interesting stuff to speculate about. Alright, second to last bit of the story here, okay? 